100 trillion. That's a one followed by 14 zeros. And yet, did you know that you have 100 trillion of something? You have 100 trillion microbes on and in your body right now. Isn't it amazing to think that you carry with you, every human being carries with them that much opportunity to spread disease into the life <laughs> of another person? Makes you feel real clean right now, doesn't it? You have literally like a thousand opportunities a day to spread disease into the life of another person just by breathing on them or shaking their hand or loaning them your stapler or sneezing in their direction or accidentally licking their face <laughs> like you do. Not that all like microbes are bad for you, that many of them are very good for you, but still this is why like in flu season, helicopter parents across the nation carry more of a variety of, uh, you know, Purell with them than a Navy SEAL has sidearms because they realize that a person has literally a thousand opportunities a day to spread into the lives of other people. Now, what if we used that picture and played what if for a second? What if each person also had a thousand opportunities a day to share good? into the lives of anybody they come across. That they could share something that could get into the life of another person and change them, but for the better. Something that might actually change their life. We're wrapping up a short series called Gratitude is a Conduct. If you've been around here and you've been here for the last few weeks, you know that we have been in this short little letter in the Bible that you could find if you'd like to. It's, it's called the Book of Romans. And the reason why we're talking about gratitude is because the first 11 chapters of Romans, which we did not preach, we just know for a fact that the first 11 chapters of Romans goes on and on about how over-the-top generous and faithful God has been to us today and forever. And because this is the way God has been to us by the time you get to Romans 12, which is the chapter that we've been in for three weeks now, Romans 12 coaches us on how to say thank you to God for all the great things that he has been and done for us. In fact, it's even better than just saying thank you even around Thanksgiving, it's, it's about living thank you. That every day, in tons of ways, we can behave in a way that convinces God that we appreciate what he's done for us. Gratitude is a conduct. So by the time we get to Romans chapter 12, we have found it as a guide for us each week to learn how do you do this? How, how can we behave and live in a way that God looks at, looks at us and goes, man, she gets it. Wow, he's appreciative. It's changed his life, and it's blessing my heart. How do we do this? Well, Romans 12 has been coaching us on this every single week. First, it's, it's, it has coached us within our direct relationship with God. Three, two weeks ago, we learned that God loves it. Man, he is so blessed. He loves it when we fully surrender our lives to him and let him start changing us from the inside out. And then last week, we talked about a sort of a wider sphere of influence in our lives. It's how we behave in our relationships within God's forever family. God loves it when we find our belonging and our purpose in his family. And Romans 12 is going to open the circle a little bit wider on what it's like to live our thanks out to God. And today we're going to see how we're going to be coached in our relationships in literally everybody else in the world. No matter who we come across, we can behave towards them in a way that expresses our gratitude to God. I'm talking about towards the other parents at the bus stop as you wait for your kid. Pick them up, drop them off. Toward anybody you run across in the coffee shop or at hockey practice or at jazzercise, over the, the water coolers and the warehouses and the waiting rooms of life, you get like a thousand opportunities a day or more 
to spread goodness and blessing and love into the lives of other people. And I'll tell you what, this is a core thought for us today. God loves it. He loves it when our changed lives are changing other lives. God loves it when he can count on us for this. That the life that he is changing is now helping other lives change as well. We get so many opportunities a day. And so this is what we're going to do today. We're going to finish our study of Romans 12. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week, which is what we had done the week before. And in Romans 12, and we're going to start at verse 9, if you'd like to find it. We're going to be in 9 all the way through verse 21. And there's some, something significant about what we're going to read today. And this is especially interesting if you're sort of a Bible gal or a Bible guy. The Apostle Paul is going to continue to describe the conduct of the grateful. But he's going to do it in such a way that every scholar I read points this out. He basically blasts off this blue sky list of ideas of what a person can do as a changed life to introduce change in the lives of other people. If you read the book of Romans, you know how just classically organized and methodical the Apostle Paul has been, building a reasonable argument, covering all the bases, that it's significant that by the time we get to where we are today, verses 9 through 21, he's basically ripping off ideas like left and right, bam, 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 bam. You can do this, you can do that. And, and what I want you to picture this morning is Paul is just like waving his arms and he's saying, dude, you've got like a thousand ways a day that your changed life can change other lives. Just, just go for it. So this is what we're going to do. We're just going to go for it. We're just going to dive right in here. And I'm going to have us think in three groupings today. The question is, if we've got like a thousand opportunities a day to be contagious, but like in a good way, what would we spread? What do you and I have that we could spread in order to see lives change? Three major thoughts here. They all come from God's word. The first life-changing thing that we can offer other people is this. Irresistible relationships. Irresistible relationships. Let me, let me show you what I mean. We're going to read verses 9 through 13. Okay, Follow along with me. Paul says this. This is how he's coaching the Christians in Rome, the churches in Rome. He says, hey, love must be sincere. Hate what's evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. And share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. You see what I'm saying here? Bam, 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 bam. But you can see by the language here, he's talking about how the believers are towards each other. And I'll tell you what, one of the most effective things that believers in Christ can do for the unbelievers in their life is to bring them to a place where they can see love working. Where they can see where love is the law, where love is the code, where love is the ethic, and they can actually see it playing out in the lives of real people and real relationships. I, I would consider, you could call this the try before you buy concept. When we're talking about bringing irresistible relationships into the lives of people who are in the market for them. Try before you buy. You're familiar with this, especially if you're a shopper at Costco. How many people just love Costco and want to send her a Valentine every Friday? You love Costco. And here's one thing that we love about Costco is especially you go there on a Saturday. You know how you go there on a Saturday and then and every aisle has an end cap. Every end cap has a little cart with a person and a chef's hat. And what are they doing? They are there to serve you food, like free food. That's the best kind of food is free food. And they're at every end cap. It is a beautiful thing. Like I've tried to get this passed into law that everywhere I go, people are just there ready, ready to just, just feed me free food. And, and, and you may know this about these vendors. They don't, they don't do this just because Costco is kind or benevolent. It actually has nothing to do with Costco. It's the vendor of, of every single product they don't do this just to be generous. Why do they do this? Well, 
They do it because, yeah, they want you to try it. They understand that if I'm going to get hooked in a lifelong way on their crab salad, they understand that it's probably not going to happen if they're just counting on me to pull it out of the refrigerated section at random and then just fall in love with what I see written on the side of the box. They believe their chances will go way up, that I would even consider their company if it is just prepared fresh right in front of my eyes where it can just hit all the senses. Let's try before you buy. And, and a, a business person might say, okay, but does that concept really work? Well, I read one study that says that it improves sales up to 2,000%. You believe that? And if you know for a fact that that's not true, could you just keep that between you and me? Because <laughs> free samples is how some of us get through grocery day. You know how that... <laughs> You know how that is. <laughs> here's, here's a fact. The fact is that the far from God crowd in your life are in the market for irresistible relationships. They've got broken relationships all around them. They are shopping for irresistible relationships. They want to know, do they exist? They might not even want to admit it to you, but if they're ever going to consider Jesus is the answer... If they're ever going to consider the company, they need something that they can encounter with their senses, something that's happening like right before their eyes. And I want to encourage you with something. We have irresistible relationship happening like here. Our church is not better or worse than in all the other churches that Jesus is in control of. But I can, I can see it. Have you seen it? I have seen irresistible relationship happening in this place. And I just want to take this moment to cheer you on and say, keep it up. You people who are calling Heritage home every week, I get this from, from people who are new. And people say, man, there's just something special happening here. And they say, wow, I've never, I, I didn't know there were churches out there like this. And I just have never seen people treat each other this way. And I, I love it because it's, it's just a sign that God is at work. We have no patent pending on anything that we're doing here except following Scripture. We're just leaning into God's heart and bringing it to other people. You are passionately putting heaven on display with what you're doing here every week. As you lean in towards each other, as you, as you, I watch you embracing each other. I watch you staying dialed in with each other on how you are doing. I see you praying for each other like right on the spot. I'll, I'll see it happen. You're, you're even honest with each other when you don't remember each other's names. <laughs> and yet you lean in anyway. And you do it with a smile. You know that you are God's person with God's people. I watch you on mission together, serving alongside of each other. And, and I, I watch how you're always, your home group and your ministry team, you're always opening up the circle wider for more people to jump in. It's awesome. It's awesome. you got to keep that up. And I want you to know that the people in your life are shopping for those kinds of relationships. Maybe you've been in this long enough to, to, to forget. Not everybody has what you have. This is, this is special stuff. And so using Paul's advice here, verses 9 and 13, let me do this. Let me encourage more irresistible relationships so that we can bring people into it. Let me encourage this. We'll go through those verses again. And I just want to give us six questions to ask ourselves. You can write these down if you want. They'll be on the screen. Maybe just find one that's challenging to you. Six questions. Here we go. The first one is this. Are we being sincere? Paul says love's got to be sincere. People can spot cheesy, churchy fraudulence a mile away, can't they? Can't they? Love must be sincere. Are we being sincere? If that challenges you, great. We're moving in the right direction. Here's another second question, number two. What do I cling to? The line I see here from Paul is, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And if this is going to be a place of irresistible relationship, I just want to say this, that this can't be a place where God's people hate what is evil, but then cling to what is evil. And here's what I mean by that, is that we can't be Christians that only find our joy and our peace when we have something to complain about, or we have somebody to complain about. If this was a place of gossip, if this was a place of negativity, I find that highly resistible, don't you? <laughs> you know what? That's not what we do. We don't cling. That's the wrong thing to cling to. We cling to what is good. Question number three. If you want to help make this place a place of irresistible relationship, ask yourself this question. Am I requiring devotion and honor or am I dispensing it? 
Do I require devotion and honor toward me, or am I dis a dispenser of it? Because we're to be devoted to one or each other, honor each other above ourselves. We live in a world where humans naturally tend to think of their own needs first. But because of Jesus, we've got the power to be supernatural. Question number four. What are we excited about? You answer that question, because Paul writes in verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. He's, he's putting fuel in their engine. And what I love around here is that we're always teaming up to help others find and follow God. Whether you're on a ministry team here, you know that. Whether you're, you're participating in a local outreach that we're mobilizing the whole church to pull off, or even something as simple as Heritage Gives. You see the, the deposit uh, area right out there for food and for coats. Want you to know we're going to run that one more week just because we keep talking to people. We're like, ah, I forgot it at home again. So we're going to run that one more week. Bring your coats. Bring your food. We're going we're gonna to get those into the hands of the families that need it. The question is, what are we excited about? We're always doing something different to help other people find and, and follow God. And so what we do is we keep that enthusiasm alive. You're, you're a carrier of that. You encourage that. We lean in. What are we excited about? Question number five, who am I standing in the gap for? Verse 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and fervent in prayer. And I want you to know something. It changes the environment here. When each of us are helping have a few people that we're helping carry their load, we're helping them through their dark days, we're, we're encouraging their faith in the midst of what we cannot change, and we're praying for them, and we're checking in on them. Who am I standing on the gap for? If you don't have a few names for that, hang on the lobby, start doing relationship, and God will give you some. Last question, how open-handed am I? How open-handed am I? Verse 13 says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Is this, is this like because our gospel is laced with socialism or something like that? No, that's, that's, not, that's not what this is. I, I, I would take this as a measure of the depth of our relationship. That is, you do business with God's family. A growing number of people are people that you would open your home for, open your refrigerator for, open your wallet for, simply because God's family is becoming a tight family. Six questions to move us in the right direction, and my advice is this. This will become a place of irresistible relationship. Bring your people here. Trust this church. We want to help take care of the person God has put on your heart, and do that every Sunday. And on any Sunday that you don't bring somebody with you, here's my next piece of advice. Help somebody else with the person they brought. Right? Because we all do this together. And if the love here is sincere, the relationships here will be irresistible. It will hit every one of their senses. And they'll start considering some of the most important things in their life that they need. All come from Jesus. So, we got a great thing that we can offer other people. It's irresistible relationship. Here's a second thing that you and I have like a thousand opportunities a day to let your changed life change other lives. It's astounding inclusion. Astounding inclusion. We love to be included. It's human need. It's the need of our psyche. And yet notice how like verse two describes the pattern of this world from a few weeks ago. Notice how culture, notice how the pattern of this world is forever drawing lines to determine who's in and who's out. You're like, oh, I thought that was just me in my grade school years. No, that's like everywhere. It's just part of the dark human heart. Drawing more and more lines about who's in, who's out. You see this across social media. There's a, there's a, a message of tolerance being preached out there. It's just really hard to live out without supernatural help. People constantly on social media are like, well, you, if, if that's how you voted, you may as well unfollow me now. You know, or if, if that's your position on this issue, you may as well unfollow me. Let me soak so I can block you. And, and, and then forever drawing lines about who's in, who's out. Now, let me tell you, that's normal. Let me tell you what's simply astounding. It's when the people in your life who know you're not agreed, who know you're not on the same page, 
who know you root for different teams, when they feel your arm coming around them anyway. And you'll include them. You will you don't write them out. You bring them along in your life. Let me show you what I mean. Let's read verses 14 through 16. Paul continues with his hit list. He's, his punch list continues with, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Here's, here's kind of what I see in this next section of ideas. It's astounding inclusion. And you can offer that to so many types of people that God brings across your path. Now, if you and I are going to be able to do this, we're going to have to root some natural thinking out of our processes. The first idea that we might not even say it out loud to, our, you know, to ourselves, but it's in there. we got to find it and root it out. The first one is this. I'll give you three ideas. The first one is this. You intimidate me. Is there a person in your life that that's your approach to them, that they intimidate you? Could be the bully at school. Could be a manager at work. Could be a certain kind of personality. Let me tell you something. We never show genuine love to the people that we think can control us. We might figure out how to be polite to them. But that's like it. We never show genuine love to the people that we think can control us. But God is encouraging us to let our actions toward them be bigger than their actions towards us. That's why he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. See, you can still give in that moment. You, that option has not been removed. Jerks need God too. And I'm here to tell you, Jerks can change. Jerks can change. And we can be a part of that, but we can't be distracted by fear on what they've done, what they can do to us. So here's something we got to just take out of our, our operation center. You intimidate me. And that's kind of where the inclusion stops. Second idea we can root out. You and I are not connected. We're, we're not connected. I see... Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Share it with you, a true story just happened a few days ago. Um, just from one guy who believes in Christ to another. I, I've been doing personal like business. I've been a patron of a, of a business of a guy for going on maybe over three years now. Over that time, we didn't have to become friends. He runs a business of clients, all clients, but... I've become a friend. I've been friendly, although I know we don't agree about a lot of things. Uh, our friendliness has turned into a friendship to the point where um, it's become very clear to me. And, and just a few nights ago, he called me at night. It was really weird. We talk once or twice a month when it's time to do business. And, and instead, he called me to share with me some personally devastating news. That's it. Not, and I need to cancel our appointment or anything like that. He just called because he knew there was a friendship there that he could rely on. And as he sort of uncorked the sadness, I, I don't do this. God does this. I felt sadness coming over my heart. My throat kind of tightening up, imagining what it would be like to be in his shoes. I told him that. I said, man, I'm just sad. I'm sad right now. And as a guy who's kind of getting this stuff ready for you, it just, it, it clicks that when we include people, we help celebrate their victories and we, and we help carry their burdens when we mourn with those who mourn. It, it, it does something for them. It helps them to know that, that they're not alone. And this is what you and I can do. You and I can carry ourselves throughout our day and send this message, this interpersonal message, that you are in my life, don't overlap. You are in my life, don't overlap. Hi, how you do? Good morning. You are in my life, do not overlap. Or what we can do is we can include people in such a way that astounds them, that they are part of our lives. It's just different. So we got to take this whole you and I are connected out of it if we want to get into the running with helping people, help their lives to change. Here's the third idea that I see here that we got to root out. I'm better than you. Come on, let's just admit it. 
wasting time not admitting that there are people that we come across in our day to day that for whatever reason, whatever we assume, we're just better than them. There's verses here. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. See, that's normal stuff. It's normal stuff for us to to believe that we are just better, that there's just some caste system, that because of their past mistakes or because of a pedigree that I come from or whatever it is, just better. That's normal. Pride is normal. Focus on social status, normal. Conceit, normal. You know what's abnormal? You know what's astounding? The way Jesus has treated everybody. He's, he's our hero in that. There was nobody who wasn't included because of who they were or where they were from. Pharisees were included. Lepers were included. Prostitutes were included. Drunkards were included. Fishermen were included. Everybody was included. Children were included. Everybody was included. And the only, reason, the only way they ever got excluded is because they excluded themselves. Because what they thought about Jesus, what they decided. This is what astounding inclusion is in our lives as well. But we got to take out of our thinking, I'm better than you. Because Jesus is better than all of us. And nobody ever got this vibe from him that they weren't good enough for friendship with Jesus. I see three majorly good things that we can deposit in the lives of people a thousand times a day. It's irresistible relationship. It's astounding inclusion. And here's the third one. It's die hard grace. Die hard grace. This is a good moment for us to sober up and and come to terms with the direction of the world, of the planet on which we live. It's getting darker out there, not lighter. You know what I'm saying? Spiritually, morally, it's getting darker out there, not lighter. Chance is what this is what this means when it comes to you and the relationships that you have in the world. Is that the chances are only going up for you. The chances are only going up for your kids. That any given relationship they have will be a hostile one. Simply because of what you believe. Simply because of your faith stance. Because you, maybe because you call yourself a Christian. The first favor we can do for ourselves is to remember that Jesus warned us that this was going to happen. Let me show you John 15, 19. He's saying this to his disciples, and that's what a lot of us are of Jesus' disciples. He said, hey, if you were of the world, the world will love you. <laughs> I love it. Everything he does is perfect. If, the, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, you're, but, you're not, uh, but because you are not of the world. I'm screwing this all up. Can I just try reading again? I'm going to... I'm going to follow along with my bookmark here. All right. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but you are not of the world. Maybe I got a typo there. I chose you out of the world, and therefore the world hates you. I don't think that's strong, Jesus. I don't feel hated everywhere I go. But Jesus is saying, no, but that's, that's the potential. That's the trajectory of the world and the trajectory of your faith. We're going two opposite directions. So... Let's not be so nicey-nicey in our heads to think that the martyrdom of Christians on the other side of the world won't happen in America one day. This is, this, is, this is the promise. It's a daily exercise of our faith to remember, you and I don't belong down here. We're here as long as God wants us to be here. But once we fully belong to Christ, we gain a forever home in the glory of heaven. We got an eternal place to go. There's a spot there for me. That's what happens when you place your trust in Jesus with your future. He, he can forgive you of your sin and reconnect you with your maker. But that also instantly makes us citizens of there and foreigners down here. Does that make sense? So if we're aware of that, then it'll give us a little permission to talk worst-case scenarios. And let's just say, given in Paul's day, to the Christians to whom he wrote in Rome, wasn't that great for them either? Christians being thrown to the wild beasts for the pleasure of the crowds in the Colosseum. I wouldn't say things were exactly going their way either. So the question is, how do we respond in all of these relationships that we have in life? How do we respond in the moments where the most 
senseless, basic evil comes our way when we are trying to live good and constructive lives? Well, here's your answer. You give them something totally unexpected. You give them something good that we have and we can give. It's called die hard grace. Verse 17 to 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If, it, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, leave it, live at peace with everyone. And don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, this is what grace is. It's completely unexpected. And this is what it means for us to be die hard about grace. Is that even when I've been unfaithful, Jesus, God has been faithful to me. He has stood there. To be diehard means that you won't be overcome by evil. You will overcome evil with good. So let me give you three ideas just from these verses. And I realize I'm talking to some people, and this is sitting really close to home right now with some things that you're struggling with. Let's look at these verses that give you three ideas on how to show diehard grace in your life. Idea number one, we don't, uh, we respond, we don't react. We respond, we don't react. This could be as this could be a situation as bogus as being discriminated against in your workplace because you're a Christian. It could be as common as just being publicly embarrassed by a cashier who rolls his or her eyes at you. Or even in the case of a bratty child screaming in your face. We respond. We don't react. Retaliation or how it's said here, repaying evil for evil. It's not how we roll. It's not what we do. Taking revenge. It's not how we roll. And I'll tell you why. One very basic reason why this doesn't work in God's economy is, or excuse me, it's not in God's economy is because it doesn't work. Ultimately, it does not work. It was the faith in Christ of one of, one of my personal heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said it this way. He said, he said darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And in the same way, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. See, we are people who set ourselves to doing things that work. And so in those moments, we take a deep breath, we regain the bigger picture, and in the lives of the people we come across, on God's appointment, we respond. We don't react. Idea number two from the text here, we make peace, just not at all costs. We make peace. An unbelieving world should know us. They should recognize us as peacemakers. We don't, we don't inflate and exaggerate situations. We deflate them. God blesses peacemakers. And so we want to live at peace with everyone we come across. Does that mean we become doormats? No. We always run from a fight. No, that's not what's being said here. In fact, if you see here, there's two qualifiers. That one, sometimes peace is beyond our control. Like us personally, there's, it's beyond us to be able to organize and arrange peace. Secondly, sometimes peace in a certain situation isn't even possible. So let's not pretend that we can change the truth for people. Let's not pretend that we would bend our integrity in order to secure some false sense of peace with, with people that we're in conflict with. But here's the deal. Die hard grace means that we do all that we can do. We take our emotions out of it. We set ourselves and our personal egos aside to do all that we can to be ministers, to serve, to, to, to deflate harsh circumstances and bring health to them. We make peace everywhere we go, just not at all costs. Third idea here. We put points on the board, on the board, but we don't settle scores. We put points on the board. We don't settle scores. Are we, are we not seeing more and more an escalating number of occurrences in our society of people who are trying to secure justice in a tangible sense and in 
that, that there's some way that we can insist on a certain specific amount of money that would repay them for the loss or the, for a hardship or the loss of a limb or the loss of a life. See where I'm going? More and more now we have people who insist on a certain amount of public repentance for crimes or sins committed a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. Now, I'm not saying that those things are, those, that's all wrong. Here's what I am saying. It's in every single person. It's in me to want to settle scores, to do the job that only a, a completely righteous judge and almighty God can do. Only he can, can do this job. And in this life, God's calling us to be different about that. We put points on the board. We're just not called to settle scores. What do I mean by that? Is that in this life, when hard things happen to us, we cling to our obedience of the ways of Christ and we trust God with the rest. When things are unfair, when things get dark, when it is completely unjust, Christian, put some points on the board in that circumstance. But don't do the job of settling the score. That's not for us. We cling to our obedience of the ways of Jesus. He's our model. He's our hero. And we trust God with the rest. I want to give you a, I want to give you a full color illustration of this. Just happened just, a, just, just no, no more than two months ago. Many of you are aware of this. I will chart a path here for people who are unaware. This horrible, horrible, horrible thing happened. Happened in Dallas. Cop gets off duty after a 13-hour shift, exhausted, goes home, walks into her apartment, sees a man, an intruder in her apartment, and out of reflex, pulls her gun out, out of defense, she shoots him. She kills him on the spot. Only realize in the next few minutes that she's in the wrong apartment. She's one floor off, and she's just shot and killed an innocent man. She's 31, he's 28. And as you know, it's, this is a firestorm, and it's, it's, things are getting crazy, and he's black, and she's white, and this is Dallas, and this, this, is all, this is all bad. What do we do in a situation like that when we're called to bless and not curse? What does diehard grace look like? I want to show you a clip from the courtroom of the day of her sentencing. Let's take a look together. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just... I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because 
I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. That's, I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. Praise God, right? So you have to ask yourself, was diehard grace put on display in that courtroom that day? I don't know. I think when you see her running and weeping into the arms of somebody that she shouldn't even know, in a place an environment of bitterness when she goes back for the fourth hug, when you see the judge wiping her eyes and eventually giving her own personal Bible to the defendant before she sends her to prison. You have to say, yeah, some major points were put on the board that day. And they're still being put on as, this, as the video is viral. Now, is the score settled? Absolutely not. People are... People are still arguing about that. Well, he didn't speak for everybody, and it was that the right thing to do, and all this, that, and whatever. Listen, we don't settle scores. We don't have to worry about how things pan out in people's eyes. With the humility of Christ, when God gives us the opportunity, die hard grace. This is where we stand. This is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness was never about scores. Forgiveness is about releasing offenses and offenders because it's exactly what Jesus did for me. Jesus said it himself. I didn't come to condemn. I came to save. One day the scores will be settled. And for the people who will fall on the wrong side of the line because they don't have the grace of God in Christ, I'm not happy about that. And until the score is settled, you and I get to put some points on the board. And that's where we stand. Die hard means you don't have to be overcome by evil. We can overcome evil with good. Up to a thousand times a day. So, church, let me just wrap up the last three weeks by, by, by saying this. Gratitude is a conduct. It's what we saw in verse one of this chapter, that an incredible gift of mercy has changed our lives. It's a mercy that can melt the hardest, coldest hearts, melted mind. And now God is saying, hey, I want you to deposit that into the lives of other people. He loves it when our changed lives are changing other lives. Broken people of this world, they will break and they will fall. The question is, whose arms will they fall into? I hope they're yours. I hope you're ready. We're not going to be caught off guard with this, are we? Let us work together together to lead them into irresistible relationship that could change their lives. Let us show them, let them experience astounding inclusion. And let us put on display a die hard grace. Because no matter how it pans out, 
God's heart will be refreshed. His eye will be on you. He loves it when changed lives are changing lives. Now, God, we ask for your grace and your mercy even in this moment as you prepare us to do incredible and unthinkable things as your humble followers. God, we, we say more of you, less of us. Father, give us vision to let you change us from the inside out and be prepared to bless and bless and bless everywhere we go. We pray that we would, as we live, be spreading your gospel and your fame and your name because you are merciful and we don't deserve to be let off the hook. And that's where you, that's where you jump in. That's when you share your love. We need you for this, God. Some of us are tense about seeing our own family this week. God, we need you. We need you for this. Help us to see what you see and give us the, just the high honor of watching lives change in your name because they got involved with us. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heritage, I love you. And in doing life together for Jesus, we're a part of something eternal. I love that. You are dismissed. We'll see you in the lobby.